Well, hi everyone. I'm Andy Asher. I'm editor over here at Bloomer Boomer. Now, today's show can be associated with so many aspects about growing up in America. You know, family dynamics, the pressures of balancing work and family, parent-child relationships, death, and what makes this all the more compelling, our story comes from someone who witnessed all this in a greater intensity than most of us will ever know. It comes from the viewpoint of a young boy, the son of a towering American football player who competed and coached at the highest levels of the game, the National Football League. Now, the NFL personifies a lot about our culture in America, the value of winning, importance of competitiveness, teamwork, money, strength. It symbolizes really a lot more than that. But you need to hear from our guest today, Michael McCormick, because he is the son of an NFL standout who shares the same name. But today, son Michael has a different side of the story to tell you. Michael is uh, good enough to visit us today in his launch of the, the new book, uh, This Is It Right Here, that's released this week, Born Fanatic. First, uh, Let's get a plug in for Bloomer Boomer though. Uh, Bloomer Boomer is about life after 50 where millions can join our community to discover what it means to thrive and embrace life when we see time ticking away. Friends and family might be gone forever, careers um, and are over and we are getting older. Health changes and our lives change. But embrace life, empower dreams, um, and Embrace Age is a mission of Bloomer Boomer that is not about conceding the end, but the beginning of new opportunities. So subscribe to the newsletter, our YouTube channel, and our lively Facebook page, live events around the country, and some really cool things. So check us out, and we'll be right back with Michael McCormick right after this. Well, our guest is author Michael McCormick with the launch of his new book this week, Born Fanatic. Michael, I want to thank you for joining us. Andy, good to be with you. Thanks for having me. So what do you think of, uh, of, of my intro into, into you? I mean, is that accurate? Uh, you, you heard it. Uh, uh, what do you think? Do you feel it was, was correct? It, it, I, I do, but I'll also tell you I'm impressed with how you describe uh, Bloomer Boomer as well because you captured essentially the essence of the whole book project. I could not have done this project until seasoned in my 50s as, as I am, as you can see. Uh -huh, uh -huh. Uh, you, you really captured it um, in terms of what you're all about, what this project was all about for me, kind of uh, grappling with a, a lifetime of the roller coaster that was we, being we in the grip of the NFL. As we get older, you know? No question. Yeah, and, and no doubt that's, uh, that's what, what you, you did in, in, in a fairly intensive way. Yeah, well, uh, as the book chronicles and you touched on it, when I was born, my father was a world champion, Cleveland Brown offensive lineman back in the late 50s. And then for another 45, 46 years, uh, all he ever did was work in the National Football League. And so it was all I knew to a large extent. Indeed, professional football was the lens through which I saw everything before I even knew what it was like to be an American or a member of my church. For better and for worse, and my, my five kids give me a hard time for this all the time, uh, all my life lessons, all my cliches, all my metaphors are born from the world of professional football. Uh, I got a lot of good out of it, no question. There are a lot of values there. Uh, but there were some twists and turns and certainly some, some dark sides to uh, my life, to my experience and my relationship with my dad. You touched on it very well. Football defined for me, as it does for a lot of America, what it means to be a man. And as represented by the violent sport of football, that ain't all good. Yeah, and uh, you said it right there, what it means to be a man. And uh, then as I'm sure you got older, it, it's much more complex than that. What was it like writing the book? It uh, must have brought up a lot of scars and things that uh, you might rather forget as well. I didn't start the writing process until 
very soon after my father passed away, which was a little over four years ago. Now, I've always loved writing. I was an English major in college. I, I've been a lawyer now for over 30 years, which involves a lot of writing, different kind, of course, than creative writing. And so when my when dad died, what I did to sort through a lot of uh, that history and a lot of the baggage was I took to journaling. Um, nevertheless, some things happened. You know, professional football, for those of, of your viewers and listeners who are familiar with the game, pro football is kind of a gift that keeps on giving. It's a bit of a soap opera. And there were some developments after my dad's death, the Ray Rice uh, domestic violence incident in particular. Sure, we, uh, we remember that, that. That wasn't that long ago. It wasn't. And it triggered some flashbacks mm -hmm. uh, for me. And I mean that I use that word flashback in, in you know, the clinical sense. And uh, that prompted me to do a deeper dive and then structure the book or my journaling, I should say, into a memoir really as part of my healing process. And, and uh, my immediate family encouraged me to frame it as a mem memoir in the event that it could maybe help some other people. We should say um, that the Ray Rice incident was an example of domestic violence. Well, the Ray Rice, yeah, the Ray Rice incident, for those maybe who aren't familiar, uh, he was accused, and in fact on video, as it turns out, of, of punching his then fiance, and uh, was banned from the league as a result of it, but not right away. Um, there, the, the league kind of treated him a little bit with kid gloves at first, and the incident that triggered the flashback was after he'd been suspended initially for just two games, he appeared on the practice field and, and he had apologized, um, as he had to do for heaven's sakes. The Baltimore Ravens fans, and he was a, a Baltimore Ravens running back, the Baltimore Ravens fans gave him a standing ovation when he returned to the field. Yeah. And, and that blew my mind, still does to this yeah. day, uh, as I write in the book, for doing uh, the minimum of what any decent human being would have to do, he got a hero's welcome. And that really set the stage for me to examine not only my own fanaticism and my own relationship with my dad that, that had uh, features of, of domestic violence early, early on in my life. Yeah, even uh, to, to blow your mind, who is a person that's been part of that for so long, it just goes to show uh, what a big incident that really was and how significant it was. In including taking stock of my own complicity, oh. quite frankly, because I, I still maintained kind of a code of silence um, and still maintained kind of a blind fanaticism devoted to the game, uh, notwithstanding the twists and turns in my relationship with my dad. Now, uh, in your book, uh, or no, actually, I think in our, we, you and I had a conversation on Friday. Um, <laughs> you talked actually about PTSD uh, and uh, something that we normally associate with people who uh, are in, in war. Uh, did I take that correctly? You, you, you did, and, and you do, and that's, that's absolutely right. And there are a lot of clinical features to PTSD. For me, it's tied to childhood and, and childhood abuse, uh, kind of cemented, if you will, by the, the celebrity that uh, professional football brought to our family and that code of silence. Uh, but the, the symptoms um, are real. The flashbacks uh, were real. That Ray Rice flashback definitely uh, was, was real. Uh, I still have um, typical symptoms of, of insomnia, I'm still hypervigilant as many who suffer from PTSD, whether it be uh, veterans of, of military combat or abuse victims. Uh, I have found ways, particularly in my older years, to, to cope with that and to heal from that. I'll say, Andy, uh, uh, launching from that, one of the most healing experiences for me was writing the book. And in the writing of the book, finding some, even though it was, it was after my dad's death, finding some reconciliation and forgiveness. I wish we found it while he was alive, but I'm grateful that I found it all the same. Yeah, and I 
I, you know, there are lots, so many things we could talk about, and we have just a limited amount of time to do it. But um, you know, let's take that uh, those lessons perhaps, and how they might apply to others. And as I said earlier in the intro, uh, you, in in our perception, probably experienced life uh, in a different level uh, than maybe uh, us average Joes. But uh, you know, how, how might you? How might someone else l uh, learn from? Uh, those experiences, whether you're the father who uh, comes home from uh, a day's work or you're the child who uh, sees that same guy every day, uh, what might be some lessons that we could take away from that? Sure. I'll, I'll hit on just a couple things that are highlighted in the book and, and some of my other writings. Uh, the first is uh, sports fanaticism, which is a double-edged sword, and we see it a lot in the news today with parents who are investing their own self-esteem in their young children and their children's performance on the field. Um, we, we need to take a look at that as individuals, as parents, and, and get a grip, for lack of a better, or, or let go of our grip, perhaps, is the, is the better phrase. Then there's this question of fanaticism beyond uh, the sports field, uh, although there's a close relationship. A lot of my research and writing, Andy, was done during the uh, 2016 presidential election cycle, and I found myself wondering as I was doing research on sports fanaticism, whether I was really reading just about sports fanaticism or fanaticism at large. And one of the things about teamwork, and this is what I learned about football and my dad's legacy as I, as I wrote the book, that football, he viewed it as the greatest team sport ever created that to be a good teammate involves making sacrifice, including sacrificing some of your fanaticism. But ultimately, the book is about the reconciliation. And those who have read the book already, some of them early beta readers, but even folks who bought the book just in the past week, have come to me and said, gosh, you know, it's, it's certainly set uh, in the realm of professional football. And it's Football is the unavoidable backstory, but it's really not a book about football, is it? It's a book about your father and, and your relationship with him. And I said, that's absolutely right. And a few readers, and this is the most gratifying thing to me, and the final message that I'd like to convey to you and, and your listeners and viewers, is these folks have told me, and, and I'll admit they're mostly men, not all though, have said, you know, having read your book, I'm going to go back and have a conversation with my dad that I've been afraid to have, but I want to have before he passes. And uh, I, I encourage that. If you've got any baggage still that's left undone, uh, take a leap of faith. I think you'll be pleased that you, you, you did it. And even if it is too late in the, the literal sense, because your, your parent, it doesn't have to be a father either, yeah. has already passed on, I think reconciliation is possible, and my book points to that. Oh. Great. This is uh, the book Born Fanatic. Uh, Michael, thanks so much for joining us. Andy, it's my pleasure. Thanks for having me. Our guest is author Michael McCormick with the launch of his new book, Born Fanatic. And uh, we'll be right back. Yep. So did you like the show? I hope so. It will be on YouTube and at Bloomer Boomer when we have other shows coming up with some just amazing guests. So please like us on Facebook and visit us at bloomerboomer.com. Until next time, so long.